On today's show, we're going to be talking about pre-made libraries. When building your design system, should you use things like MUI, Ant Design, Web Awesome, or whatever the flavor of the week is, or should everything be as vanilla and custom as possible? I am Luke Murphy, and I'm joined by my co-host Michelle and extra special guest Dave Darns. We're all advocates at Zero Height, the design system management platform, and this is Design Systems WTF. Um, who wants to start with the spiciest take? <laughs> well, I mean, this was your your topic idea, Michelle. So maybe yeah, you, I could you can I could kick it off because I I think a lot of a lot of teams have this question, and I don't I feel like they want the right answer, but I feel like the right answer is it depends. But maybe <laughs> I don't know. I I kind of I feel like maybe maybe it doesn't depend. I like well, I'm also not a developer, so I don't have to do any of this coding. But I like having a custom done thing. <laughs> Yeah, like making your own, like coding your own library from scratch and not using MUI or Ant Design or anything like that. That's my take as a as a designer. Oh, cool, done. We could shut the podcast up now. <laughs> it's funny because I was about to kind of say the same thing. I was, well, I was going to say the other <laughs> answer and just go, "Yeah, you can use a library if you want," and then just walk out of the room <laughs> and just leave because <laughs> I. I I think the whole thing's like a kind of spectrum. Like a, you you can yeah. you can start with what's pre built, what's out there, and and build a little bit on top of that. And you could go fully like fledged, like completely custom. Kind of relates to what we were talking about last time with like your design system itself. Do you roll your own and build your own? Like, well, you can do, but it just all depends on like the scale of your business, how much customization. Like, what's your design team scale or size? And like, what's your development team size and things like that? And I've seen great success from companies that have used like Google material design and built on top of that to get way further than they ever would before and then deviate and kind of merge it in and create their own from that rather than like go, oh, well, let's reinvent the uh, button or I don't know, reinvent this and reinvent that. I think there's a middle ground but maybe michelle like i i guess like i don't know like i've I've known some developers who want to save time by using a pre-built library but then and it sounds like a good idea at first and then all of a sudden you start to expand your design system and your needs and they get really niche and then you end up having to like really like reconfigure things or start from scratch or things just like start to get like the, the, the value doesn't pay off in the long run is like kind of what I've seen um, teams that I've worked with end up like kind of going, oh, oh shit, like we've hit a like we've hit a blocker and this isn't this isn't working. Um, I think that is that's that's what I've definitely come across before. It's the like if you do it with the tacit understanding that you will probably have to unpick that shit later. Um, it's it's not necessarily a bad thing, but as somebody who has had to, I mean, okay, this is things have moved on since then, but I have had to do that unpicking three different versions of Bootstrap from a product that is ten years old, and like dealing with that level of legacy code, especially with something like Bootstrap where it is very heavily integrated into like. You know, it was all through like classes and stuff. It was a nightmare to unpick, especially because we were trying to do it quickly. Um, and so, like, I think that that was something they didn't think about. I think there was a um, there's a really good article. I don't know if it's still around, but um, it's a really good article by uh, a person called Jem Gold, um, who is probably best known for creating the like Sketch to React plugin. Worked for Airbnb and and, and all that back in the day, but came up in like the hacking space and made a, a wrote this amazing article about the analogy of like building castles on sand um and the idea of like these frameworks and these like pre-built things are really great to get started quickly but if what you're building if what you're building is a shack it's okay to build that with a foundation of sand if what you're trying to build is a castle like there will be a point where shit starts to fall down and fall apart now i don't know i really liked that analogy of like you know actually take a little bit of time thinking about what your foundations need to be um uh, and and you know as i said if if you do make that decision just 
do it with your eyes wide open. Or I, just, you know, plan to leave the company in two years and leave it up to somebody else. <laughs> There's a one way to do it. I I think I think it, that there's a pertinent point there about thinking carefully about choices and being very intentional with what you pick up. And like that sounds awful having to pick apart three different versions of Bootstrap. And then I, I've had my fair share of like Bootstrap projects in the past. And and in my opinion, it was always like the intention of Bootstrap was eventually to take it out, like scaffolding, like yeah. literally like yeah. like building scaffolding. You would just take it out, and eventually that that design system or that ui would just hold its own anyway yeah and and you would have evolved beyond it and as long as you did it responsibly with the same version and didn't like mix and match (laughs) stuff you would be you would be fine and it's the same for things like tailwind and um you know like component libraries and stuff like that that maybe you'd be able to pull them out or derive from them at some point but you got to be very responsible and like intentional i i i think there is value in using them as a stepping stone to get to the next point of like your own custom like ui or design system what is it it's um uh make these decisions and build these things um as if the future maintainer is a psychopath who has your home address um i think was the <laughs> was the way of viewing it <laughs> i think it was more polite i said it would be more polite to myself to be like what if it was me and I'm the psychopath. <laughs> yeah it's um yeah it is it's an interesting one but i mean but then again you know do you think that there are do you think that there are cases where that's enough as well like and will probably always be enough i i guess like i don't know for me maybe like a personal project because like you you know you don't want to spend time having to design and code everything you just want like a personal project to work so um, my partner, and I made like a recipe app to kind of help with meal planning and grocery shopping. And we didn't want to do too much UX and coding. So we just used something that was pre-built to quickly spin things up and it's, it, it works. Um, but yeah, like it's nothing special about it. It's like very pragmatic. Um, so I think like if you're trying to, you know, create a proof of concept or something like that, it might be really good just to, to have something, um, quickly. I'm seeing, I'm just peering into the chat and I can see a lot of talk about MUI um, or MUI uh, component library. I don't want to call it a design system. I feel like a design system is owned by a company and a UI kit is like a commercial, like sold product. Oh, but you can't... what about material design? Because, you know, it's both. It, it, um, it's, it's Google's design system that happens to be a package like offering <laughs> as well. I, I, yeah. I feel like they're two different things. Like Mui is more like a component library that, or a UI kit that's sold to, to people. And there's interesting like mixed experiences of using Mui. Um, and it brings me to the thought about like these open source or like premium like libraries that are provided for many different companies are inevitably going to be quite vanilla. And being in like the working in the healthcare industry prior to this, like you have to create UI that's catered for that sector. Mm. Like, for example, we had to spend a long time creating iconography for cats and dogs and pets and all sorts of different things. And like, you'd be funny enough that not every uh, icon library has uh, a lizard icon. So, you know, you kind of have to create these unique things for it. And it can get more and more complex, like components for those use cases rather than just having generic library. You're going to get, you become unstuck like what Michelle's talking about, you, you, you can't cater for what your audience is. I... Yeah, and like not to like, I don't know, diss Google, but if you look at like material design and then you look at like all the Google products out there, like you can see some semblances of material being used, but then there's a lot of custom stuff in all those apps. Mm. So I think that's like, I don't know. Well, yeah, it's like, it's so genericized. But that's also because Material was originally designed as something to use, uh, like, to be part of the Google ecosystem. So especially with things like Play Apps, right? Um, Because that's what I was about to get into is, like, and and I was just doing a quick Google to to see. But, like, because Apple don't currently provide any sort of base system to work off. I, I mean, they've got the, you know, the inbuilt components when you're, you know, opening up Xcode or whatever. Um 
but uh, whereas material uh, material Google do when it comes to those things, and that it, that can be really important when you're dealing with things like um, uh, Play Store apps or App Store apps, because you if you don't follow those those guidelines, it can like actually harm your like placement within the app stores. Um, and you know whether you ever get promoted or how high you chart and all those kind of things, and those things can make or break companies. So I think like there there can be cases for like using those kind of things like or you know if if there was something that was provided that could you know provide a base for you to build off but i think it's a pretty narrow like use case there yeah you'll like tend to outgrow it pretty quickly yeah. um but it is like it's it's nuts the level of detail they go into where it's like you know i remember Google saying to us in the past when we were trying to get featured on the Play Store, they were like, yeah, yeah we'll feature you on the Play Store. Uh, so your buttons uh, don't currently do this like exploding animation when you click on them. Uh, they currently do like a, a slightly slower exploding animation. So can you fix that? And then we'll feature you. Um, wow. And it was like down to that like level of detail of following their, uh, well, their design system, basically. Um, the material kind of police. Down. Yeah, yeah, and I <laughs> and I wonder whether they follow that themselves, like Michelle said. Like all these Google apps will have something unique to them. Like I remember the the FAB, the the floating action button. Yeah, the every, button. Yeah, that became like a big thing, and then yeah. like it, it it that seemed like unique, and then not every app would need it, and yet they would put it in. I, you know, the the, the, the irony of inconsistencies. <laughs> well, yeah. also. I don't know. I I also found I have a hot take on this that is completely off topic, but um, uh, I actually think that that adhering too closely to those things can just make your product and your app seem really shit and generic. Uh, and it's one of the biggest. I mean, this is a, another topic entirely. It's actually it's a really good topic on the whole flexibility of a design system thing. Uh, it's I, I think it's one of the things that contributed to the death of um, Windows Phone and the Windows apps was one of the things that they went really hard on was that particular, the Metro design language. Um, and you couldn't get approved if you weren't, and you definitely wouldn't get featured if, if you didn't have the Metro design language. Um, but it was so rigid that every single app ended up looking the same, and therefore there was no distinguishing between quality easily, uh, which is quite often, you know, design is used as a, a key, dis like easy distinguishing marker uh, between apps. But anyway... I was going off on a tangent there. The, the failure of the Windows mobile phone wasn't because no one <laughs> bought it. It was because of their, their apps looking the same. Actually, like one of the main reasons it failed was because the, yeah, was because the apps weren't there for it. Um, the phone itself was baller. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting off on a tangent even further here. Maybe we need another podcast on About why the Windows, Windows phone. <laughs> yeah, mobile phone. I only, my friend had a Windows mobile phone. Um, and then she switched when she couldn't play Pokemon Go like everyone else could. <laughs> anyway, um, that's a whole other topic. I do have, uh, whilst we're waiting for the um, the questions to roll in in the chat, um, I I do have another related um, spicy take. And I'd be especially keen to hear Dave's uh, thoughts on this. I actually think that keeping shit as vanilla as possible is good in a lot of aspects of design systems, including what frameworks you use. Would I, yeah. you agree? Yeah, yeah. I mean, forgive me, but I always think from a technical perspective and like like what what I hear as vanilla is like using as little frameworks as possible and, and kind of keeping quite near the metal in terms of yeah. what you're using like as much html as possible and just enriching stuff that way an interesting question that someone asked in uh i, I use mastodon a lot and i've got there's a few people that we i talk to about uh web components as well as design systems there and someone asked like are web components the new design system and i was like well that's a like a spicy question and i said I said yes now to like you can do really good components with it but there's a lot of new stuff coming out in terms of front-end development that will make design systems and consistent ui a lot easier without having to reach for complex libraries and complex javascript i know i'm going completely off, off piste here 
but like to bring it back to what you're saying is as vanilla as possible the technology especially css is getting to a point where we'll be able to do everything very vanilla yeah. style which yeah. is fantastic like this like at layer and like all property for like resetting everything to a baseline and like overriding stuff so you wouldn't battle things like three versions of bootstrap you'd be able to like nuke it in like one elegant swoop and, and start again um so i'm absolutely all for that because as people as some people are saying in the chat about like using certain like components or libraries that you can just get yourself in the right pickle with the complexity of just installing like five different libraries for tooling so i think that spicy take was actually about as spicy as butter chicken but um that's fine but, <laughs> that <is> but <laughs> i think it's interesting because so kevin's asked a question in the chat which which i think is a, a logical next step on this is is why do we think web components haven't taken the lead why is everybody still using react angular and view um i it's really interesting because you said this around like is web components the future of design systems i did a podcast with brad two years ago where he was like we use web components for everything uh on the design system and so like he's been shouting about it for years like so i don't mm -hmm. think it's a particularly new thing right but i also don't think that it's something that everybody uses currently no is that no. is that fair like yeah yeah i mean so when when we were on nord health well <laughs> okay well it's a, like it's a long long story and i'll try and keep it as short as possible but like in on when I worked uh, on the Nord design system, that was all web components. And the, the great benefit to that is that we could appeal to like a the Django application, to a React application within a wrapper, uh, a Vue application, a Ruby application. We could like provide it for everything and we would only have to build it once. Um, but to answer like Kevin's question about why didn't web components take the lead? Like it's it's it will gradually take more of a lead it the, the problem is react and angular have meta and um what's angular the uh google behind it like they they have like like real money behind it web components is a spec thing and the spec the html spec and, and the the browser specs work <laughs> very much slower um but more intentionally i mean view as well is another thing well Actually, there's another layer to this question is that you don't think of them exclusively. Don't think about them as exclusive tooling. You wouldn't replace React with web components. You wouldn't replace Angular with web components. You would use them together. Web components are just HTML elements that are missing from HTML. And when you add them in, then you can start wiring them up together inside of a React application or an yeah. Angular application or a Vue application. But I think this, yeah. this is what it comes down to um the the fact that like if you keep things as close to uh the browser as possible close to the like the vanilla html css and you know vanilla javascript as possible or even get rid of javascript uh, <laughs> but like well you keep it as vanilla as possible you've got less chance in the future of having to like re do everything um and you know i think it's like every single company at the moment is is currently trying to um, rewrite everything in React, right? Like because they yeah. did it in Ruby or Angular before, and every, Django, and everyone's unhappy. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Is like I think like the the adoption cycle just kind of takes a really long time, and it's just like a lot of companies are migrating to React because they see other companies doing that. But then it takes it takes a while. Like people have to learn new things, and you know, like refactor all of their existing things, and so they're not going to quickly adopt things yeah um it's just going to take time i think we have a great question here from marlon um so sometimes you have a heavy-handed wet behind the ears engineering manager who comes in and asks why we are rolling our own custom library that fits our precise needs when we should use mui or something off the shelf how do you actually convince someone higher up in management which one is the right path um so when it, I I am I'm not completely familiar with the phrase wet behind the ears. Is that like, is that like when they've just joined? And yeah, they, yeah, the idea yeah, is yeah. that they're okay, fresh, just sure. fresh. Yeah. Well, 
I mean, they ain't gonna know the context. Like that's kind of mm. the, at the core of it. Like them coming in with the big like ban hammer and saying we should use Mui, Mui like we it worked for us at the previous company. That's like that's very naive like approach to to jump in with. However, you can't go to that to the you know head of whatever department to say they're being naive and childish or anything. <laughs> Uh, what you would say is that you well, form a that, union and do it collectively. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What you would say is we've spent a huge amount of time to make this uh, component library or this e UI or this design system to work for our specific needs and throwing this all into the bin would be a massive like cost to us because we've spent so much time and money in it and it would be beneficial for us in the long term. And yeah, we could buy it off the shelf and get halfway there, but it would take almost as long to kind of match up to what we had prior. It, that's how I see it. I think. Yeah. I think another one is is collecting anecdotal data, um, using things like design system Slack and whatnot, places where there's a lot of people, or just you know going on X and doing it. Um, but asking folks who have done this before and uh, how long they spent refactoring to get it to be something that they could actually use in the future or um or even just asking people how long they spent refactoring from you know one language to another um because all of these things are uh very similar in in context and it's like that is the reality is is that you will probably have to refactor at some point and it's like is that person comfortable with that yeah i think like i think that's yeah it, it's like it's how much time people are willing to be patient with um, yeah. because it is going to take time. Um, I did have this happen to me where the head of, of our company, our CTO was like, Hey, we should use this other library. I helped work on it and it's really awesome. And it would help us out. Oh, the worst. Um, and so, um, I like didn't disagree, but I was like, I don't know how, like, like we're in such different stages of design system maturity. But it was the idea was like, OK, if there's a new project that comes along, maybe they can start using that. But like everyone else will continue rolling with what we currently have, which was like, I don't know. It was a way to kind of deflect things <laughs> to procrastinate and like pick it up later. But then, I mean, I think that that's the other thing is like that sounded like a feasible plan, but things just take time at an enterprise company anyway. So it kind of like fizzled out as an idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think Stalling. I do. I do think, like, as, as much as I was joking about the whole um, start a union and collectivize, um, but I do think that getting like, if if they are being, if you've you know presented all the arguments, you've collected the data, you've gone to them, you've been reasonable, and they're still being a dick, um, then um, I think like getting the engineers together and like actually taking a pulse from the other people who care about it and showing that this is something that would not, you know, win the many kudos with the team um, is, you know, not, not necessarily a bad thing to do. It's probably like a last resort because it is kind of sticking your flag in the sand and saying, we're, we're on this side. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm just mixing metaphors now. I am. Um, I'm, I'm stooping in on the conversation between, uh, May is is it Sean or Shane? Yeah, um, uh, they are talking about like using other libraries like Rad Radix and Aria Kit. I'm not quite familiar with, but I'm definitely familiar with Headless UI, and I know that that actually can be quite powerful. That can be quite useful. Mm. Headless UI is is what is kind of what it sounds like. It's not the design part of the UI. It's the interactivity and being able to control bits of UI in the right way. We used a uh, library called uh, Tanstack Table uh, at North mm. Health to be able to like organize and format um, tables. So we could still use our components and our design for the tables, but we could do sorting, we could do like resizing, column ordering, and all sorts of like powerful stuff like that, but without having to sacrifice or, or to succumb to like a specific design, whether that be somebody's like bootstrap design that they derive that's in their library or whatever. It was just, you could do whatever design you'd like 
Um, so I think that is a good option to go down if you still want to have that level of customization. Radix is, in my opinion, quite stylized. And I would be worried that your website would just end up looking like Vercel or something similar, <laughs> like that. That dark, is that a bad shiny... thing? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it does look quite nice. It does look quite nice, but you know, like you want to, you want to put your own mark on it. You want to be unique. I mean, everybody's just waiting for the zero height website update next week, where we, um, where we turn into a shiny dev company. But, uh, <laughs> um. Brilliant. Uh, we did just to get a, a last minute question in the chat, but um, sorry, I just had a brain fart moment. Um, but we have unfortunately run out of time because it is two, two past five already. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab that question in the chat and put it into uh, Slack uh, in zeros, which we didn't share the, uh, the link for signing up to. Um, so I'll do that now. Oh, you already did it. There we go. Thank you. Um, so if you want to, so what we'll do is we'll put that in the the um, design systems WTF channel on the zero Slack, and we'll do like a async answer there. Um, and and note for Paul to edit all of that stuff out. Uh, <laughs> uh, so now I can actually finish the podcast proper. Um, that's it for today. Uh, I think that was a good one. Uh, if you've got any questions or comments or objections uh, and you want to fire them across to us, um, then please do so. You can come and join the Zero Slack community by going to zerohight.com slash Slack. Uh, you can also suggest topics for future shows as well. Uh, you can also get in touch with us on X at Zero Height. I, I will. I always, I always have a visceral reaction to want to call it Twitter. Um, or you can shoot us an email at community at zerohight.com if you're over the age of 35. Um, that's it for today. See you again in two weeks. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>